The Secret of Conde Hermanos by Clarissa Bell Chapter 17 The truth of the matter was that Gwen and Alex's marriage had dissolved not so much because of the brief dalliance she had with her guitar instructor, Eduardo Canderas, as with the much-anticipated comeback of the legendary classical guitarist, Alexander Legoya. After all, Gwen had managed to get two coveted tickets to the sold-out concert at UCLA's Royce Hall to celebrate their 10th wedding anniversary. It was at Alex's suggestion that she invited Eduardo instead. Alex having admitted that he had stupidly signed on for a sale to Catalina that weekend, which was non-refundable. A concert by Alexander Lagoya was to be a comeback of unprece unprecedented proportions an event for which one would think else, anything else on the calendar would have been easily eclipsed. The goy and his guitar had not been seen or heard on the concert stage in well over a decade, owing to his decision at the height of his career, and prenaturally early at the age of 38, to quit the concert stage. Now at 51, he was coming out of his self-imposed retirement as all the world clamored to hear him break his long-held silence. Why did he retire again, Alex had asked. Not quite the guitar aficionado he later professed to be. Because of a broken heart, Gwen had explained gravely. Oh, really? Alex had teased, as usual. Do such things still go on in the world? This is not a laughing matter, Alex. Gwen had responded, holding her ground. For this was indeed a modern tragedy of Shakespearean proportions, the like of which was seldom seen in the world today. Legoya and his wife, Ida Presti, had once reigned as the world's greatest classical guitar duet. Both had been child prodigies. She was of French origin and studied with Segovia. He was Egyptian and studied with Villa Lobos. First time she heard him play in Paris when she was 27, he was 22, she pronounced him the greatest guitarist she had ever heard. They began to perform regularly together and had married the following year. From then on, whenever they formed together, the communication between the two guitarists was to have said to be so intimate, so deeply personal, that a magical spell was cast, and the audience were transfixed by it. In fact, so extraordinary and palpable was the experience that something mystically actually had transpired. The sound of a third guitar was mysteriously yet undeniably heard rising above the interplay of their commingled notes. Then abruptly it all came to an end. And at the age of 43, Ida Presti died in New York during a U.S. concert tour. Doctors tried desperately to stop the sudden massive hemorrhage on her lung, but to no avail. She quickly succumbed, and so did a part of Alexander Lagoya, who lost all desire to perform without her. You know, Lagoya did more than anyone else to elevate the status of the guitar after Ida's death by convincing the Paris National Conservatory to finally admit it to their cu curriculum. No! Alex said must mock but his disbelief. How? Elementary, Gwen continued, ignoring Alex's failure to be moved by a recounting of the story. He applied for a teaching position at the conservatory, a placement that had never previously existed. Professor of guitar. He was quite naturally accepted and eventually gained for the guitar long overdue respect. His most enduring legacy will always be his love for Ida Presti and the transcendent music their love created. Well, good for them, Alex nodded offhandedly. You and Eduardo should have, have a really great time. If anyone could have said to have lived a charmed life, it was most certainly could have been Eduardo Candeles. He had entered the United States over 40 years ago as a young deserter from the Mexican Air Force, having been involved in an illicit affair with the wife of his commanding officer. Consequently, he had been questioned at gunpoint in a deserted alley and forced to do some pretty fast thinking to save his very life. After successfully convincing his commanding officer that he had mistakenly accused, he, with the help of Sather, a customs broker for Wells Fargo, was smuggled to safety in Los Angeles, where he began a new life as a humble busboy at an exclusive restaurant on La Cienega Boulevard. 
The restaurant was patronized by the Hollywood elite, as well as royalty and captains of industry from across the globe. Among their illustrious clientele was J. Paul Getty's fifth wife, who visited whenever she and her entourage chanced to be in town. Eduardo, being from a distinguished Mexican family, stood out from the other busboys because he spoke fluent English, was highly educated, played classical guitar, and cut a dashing athletic figure. He quickly became the darling of Teddy Getty, as he charmed his, her inner circle with his native wit and natural elegance. Before long, Teddy employed her mischievous matchmaking skills. Eduardo found himself betrothed to her dress designer Vera, an exquisite beauty, albeit twice his age. Exactly one year after his arrival in the United States, he now counted himself among the honored guests at the very restaurant at which he had been bussing tables but a few short months ago. Didn't it seem odd, Gwen asked him when she first heard the narrative, being so young and married someone to someone twice your age? I was never aware of Vera's age, he had explained, only of her beauty. She was never old to me, and we were a happy couple. The marriage lasted ten years, during which Eduardo grew used to being introduced as an oil man from Mexico, to save face in the highest echelons of society in which they moved. He, who had never had played golf before, now found himself doing so regularly, and his innate athletic prowess gave him a natural red edge over his more seasoned opponents. He fought hard to suppress his, la he fought hard to suppress his laughter as he watched others ponder long and hard before putting their balls into holes mere inches away, resisting his useful urge to just kick the balls, for God's sake. He later reminisced with glee. Whenever they went out to lunch with Teddy, which was often, he always picked up the tab, causing Teddy to remark that he was the only man she knew who even offered to pay the check for her. To Eduardo, it would have been ignoble, ignoble to allow her to pay no matter how rich she was. That wasn't the point. Eventually, their age difference did catch up with them, and Vera granted them an amicable divorce. True to character, he insisted on paying her alimony, which was not especially, which he did not especially need, which she did not especially need. Her first job was teaching classical guitar at the Lorindo Almeida School of Music in Hollywood. Later, he auditioned at an open call and was hired as the onstage guitarist for the Broadway touring company of Man of La Mancha. By this time, Eduardo had remarried and had a newborn son. With his new family in tow, he crisscrossed the country while the musical played to sold-out audiences everywhere. He also gained a deep respect for the hard-working Broadway actors, noting that Richard Carley, none unlike a professional basketball player, ended each performance drenched in sweat and at least 15 pounds lighter for the ordeal. 15 pounds lighter from the ordeal. In two years' time, when the tour ended, he chose to settle in San Francisco with his young family and became part of the Flamengo Renaissance, then underway in North Beach. He was taken under the wing of Sabacus, or Sabas, or, or Sabas, as he was familiarly called, and learn, learned the art of guitar accompaniment for dancers, which relied on an arcane communication system conveyed through a dancer's footwork. He was privileged to attend, privileged to attend performances in which he, the Sabacus accompanied Carmen Amaya at the Chateau Madrid and learned much from watching the artistic collaboration of two such incomparable geniuses. When Gwen had met him 10 years ago, he was the most highly recommended private guitar instructor in Los Angeles, where he eventually re relocated due to the lucrative work in film and television there. After a LaGoya concert, in which he had insisted on escorting Gwen backstage so as to have her program autographed by LaGoya himself, it was truly a historic occasion, and one to be remembered for all time. The evening in which and Alexander LaGoya had broken his long-held silence. When Alex returned from Catalina the following morning, he had wondered momentarily where Gwen was. Out, no doubt, buying the Sunday New York Times. This would keep her busy all afternoon with her nose in a double acrostic, he surmised. Strange, he thought, that she hadn't made coffee. Oh well. Could easily get a quick cup to go to Cafe Casino before hopping on the bike path and getting in a good ride. Maybe even back to the marina, for he hadn't something been said against the crew about getting together at a pub on Lincoln Boulevard for a few beers after lunch. Yes, he thought. It could actually work out rather well. 
When Gwen got home later that morning, she observed that Alex's duffel bag was back, but his bike was gone. She made a pot of coffee and set about framing her program from the night before. To Gwendolyn it read, With best wishes, Alexander Lagoya. She hung it in the kitchen, and drinking her coffee, sat and stared at the words for a long time.